Local road companies took steps to halt fertilizer shipments ahead of the actual date a strike could have taken place. Fertilizer companies worried that could happen again. The agreement gives workers a 24% raise over a five-year period. The bill to enforce it received bipartisan support in the House, but the majority of the chamber's Republicans voted against the measure. Among that group was Georgia Republican Austin Scott. When we spoke with him, we asked him why the measure didn't gain his support. It's a 24% wage increase. It's a retroactive wage increase. Uh, you've got a situation with the rails where you have uh, pretty much an unregulated monopoly in certain areas, if, if not a monopoly, an oligopoly, and then you have unions in control of those things uh, in many cases. And so we've got a bad situation in this country with transportation. We should have never, never allowed ourselves to get into that position. But it's a 24% uh, retroactive wage increase. And uh, what we're doing when we approve things like this is we're rewarding uh, bad behavior. That's not reasonable. Most Americans are not getting a 24% wage increase. Most Americans, when they do get a wage increase, don't get it retroactively. And certainly, when you talk about the increased cost of that, it's going to be embedded in the price of everything that we buy you know, in this country. And so I would challenge everybody listening to this to go through a Home Depot or a Lowe's or a hardware store and see if you can find an American-made power tool anymore. And the fact of the matter is uh, the unions have gone too far in this country, and we've unioned ourselves out of a lot of the jobs in the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. So was your opposition to this particular uh, and your vote in this particular case uh, an issue with the deal itself or with the structure of the rail industry? More, more so with the deal itself. And the fact that it actually had to be brought to Congress uh, is frustrating to me. But it, it is an unreasonable demand from the unions that they get a 24% wage increase retroactively or they're going to shut down the U.S. economy. They shouldn't have that much control over the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. So I want to pivot to, to different subjects as well here. Uh, obviously, right now in the lame duck session, uh, a number of things uh, on the agenda for Congress, including uh, a government funding bill and some other uh, kind of last minute legislation that folks are hoping to move uh, still in the current Congress for, for your foreign policy priorities. Anything in particular you'd like to see resolved here in the lame duck? Yeah, I, there, there are issues with crop insurance and other things where, where we're very concerned about the increased cost of production. Uh, and, and want to make sure that if, if there is anything done in uh, some type of omnibus bill, that we make sure that we give uh, the funds that are necessary for the crop insurance system uh, to the USDA so, so that we're able to operate it effectively. We know we're going to have uh, increased cost of operations and inputs in agriculture next year, and so we just, you know, we would ask that if there is an omnibus bill that we make sure that we are giving uh, the USDA, the resources necessary to, to, you know, allow our producers to hedge their risk through, through the crop insurance system. Well, earlier this week, South Dakota Republican John Thune said Senate Republicans might try to use the upcoming debt limit negotiations to leverage congressional Democrats into spending cuts. In the House, Georgia Republican Austin Scott says that's an idea he would support, but understands it will be politically difficult. I don't know that I see it happening between now and December, but I will tell you, we spend too much money in this country. We've got $31 trillion in debt, and I do think that we have a lot of agencies out there that we have continued to fund uh, at increased levels that are, that are not currently authorized or, and haven't been reauthorized in decades in this country. So I think one of the things that we should push forward is that any agency that is not operating under a current authorization, uh, their, their funding level should be frozen. And, and they should not receive any increase and, uh, in, until that agency is reauthorized. And then you can have some negotiations along those lines. I certainly think that uh, as, as we look at the national debt, we have to be honest about where we are. It's over $30 trillion right now. Uh, it has not had the impact on the federal budget because interest rates have been so low in the past. And now that interest rates are moving up, you're going to see it continuing to take a bigger and bigger chunk out of the cash flow of the country. And so uh, while it's been a concern for, for many of us for a long period of time, it, it is now going to become a cash flow issue. You can't simply uh, run trillion dollar deficits in the country and not address uh, total spending. So I think he's right with his concept of, of total spending cuts in exchange for uh, whatever the debt limit uh, increase would be.
Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Farm Bill. Uh, obviously, we're in the post-midterm election environment. We know a lot more about the makeup of Congress for, for the upcoming Farm Bill reauthorization. Uh, but we also know that the House uh, Republicans will have the majority, but it will be a very, very slim majority. Wondering what you think the impact of, of that slim majority will be on the legislation that that chamber is going to be able to produce. Well, I, I think it means that we'll be taking smaller steps in the right direction instead of the bigger steps that we had hoped to take if we had a a larger majority. When it comes to what we do with nutrition, I think we'll have an honest debate over uh, whether or not we should limit choices, if you will, and, and, and make changes in what people can buy with uh, SNAP benefits. I'll tell you one of the things that makes sense to me is to, is to allow people to buy some of the hot foods like rotisserie chicken and, and other things that actually are healthy. And it doesn't make sense to me that we allow people to buy candy bars with SNAP benefits. So if it is about nutrition, then I do think that uh, we need to have that honest debate about what people uh, are, are allowed to buy. And, and on one side, we can expand it. Rotisserie chicken, I think, is probably the best example of good, healthy food that people should be allowed to buy. And I think that on the other side, we probably need to restrict access to uh, the candies, if you will. Uh, so, so I hope we have that debate when it comes to, to total spending on the uh, nutritional aspect of things, I hope that we will see uh, an able-bodied working age adult uh, requirement put in and whatever savings we have there, then we can turn around and we can give those savings to uh, whether it be the food banks or whether it be school lunch programs. I do think that uh, we do need to make sure that we're taking care of people who can't take care of themselves, but we don't need to have this system that allows people to take advantage of it by simply choosing not to work. So those are debates that we're going to continue to have. We'll have other debates um, over, over the cost of, of ag inputs and, and what needs to be done with crop insurance and the ability for, for people to hedge their losses. And uh, that's going to be a huge debate. I'll, I'll tell you, I do not see uh, inflation going away in agriculture. I, I, I look at what's happening in Europe and the and, uh, fertilizer production, uh, nitrogen, potash, the other things that used to come from Russia and Belarus and the Black Sea, those are off the markets. Uh, we can't, we, we will uh, look at how we would help build uh, nitrogen manufacturing and other potential fertilizer manufacturing inside the United States. But I'm very concerned about the lack of fertilizer that we'll have next year because of the, the shutdowns in Europe right now because of the cost of energy over there. And just mm -hmm. uh, proof, proof again that, um, good energy policy is what the U.S. has got to have if we're going to have good ag policy. Those two go hand in hand. Well, and, and let's 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 talk about some of those costs of inputs and some of the margins that producers uh, that uh, that producers are facing because we've already seen a number of commodity groups call for in kind of their policy processes call for increases in, in things like reference prices, call for additional commodity right. supports. But are you all going to have room in a very tight budget scenario to offer that kind of assistance? Well, I, th I think we'll have to. And and the bottom line is. Uh, you know, with higher input costs, you, you, you simply got to have uh, a higher reference price because, because your loss, your loss number changes, right? I mean, if it costs you a uh, dollar to grow something that, that a year or two ago it was costing you 80 cents to grow, then your break even is at a dollar, not at 80 cents. And so I think we have to have an, an honest discussion about the, you, you know, the reference prices. The other thing that I'm very concerned about that we haven't talked about yet is if you look at what they're doing with the, the H-2A wages, you're looking at a, a an administration that is mandating a 14% wage increase on H-2A labor. Well, guess what? I mean, the, the, the countries that we're competing with, that my producers specifically are competing with, Mexico, uh, they're not having to eat those wage increases. And so we, we're seeing a continuing number, number of things done through the Biden administration that is harmful to American agriculture and, and our food supply and makes us more dependent on foreign countries for that food supply. So we're going we're gonna to have that honest debate about uh, increased cost of diesel, increased cost of fertilizer, increased cost of wages, taking fumigants and, and other chemicals off the market. And then you turn around and you see uh, the left coming back and saying, well, we want to take some of the money out of production agriculture. They want to take some of the money out of production agriculture for environmental related policies. We simply can't let that happen. We cannot let the environmentalists step into the funds that are currently used to support production agriculture and the food supply in the United States 
and move those funds to uh, environmental policy. There's very little left for production agriculture as it is in the farm bill. Well, and, and I want to uh, follow up or, and, and I guess wrap up our conversation asking about a piece of legislation that you introduced, I believe it was uh, in the, the first year of, of the current Congress, and that was to expand the Commodity Credit Corporation, uh, the borrowing limit available to the CCC. That was legislation that you introduced prior to uh, seeing some of the uh, work that uh, the Biden administration, Secretary Vilsack, uh, has, has done with the CCC, in particular the things like the Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities. Does growth in the CCC, it is growth in the CCC, something you still support after seeing the way it has been used by, by both the Biden administration now and the Trump administration before that? I, I do think that the CCC is extremely important to production agriculture in this country. Uh, I, I'm disappointed in, in the way uh, they have chosen to use those funds for environmental related policy instead of for production agriculture. And I think that's one of the areas that when we go to write the farm bill, you know, we're going to have to we're going to have to make sure that funds that are set aside for production agriculture do not get stolen from production agriculture and put into the things that they were never intended for. But but you you understand we're dealing with an with an administration like we've never dealt with before. This this administration has much less respect for uh, the law and the Constitution than any presidential administration that I have ever dealt with. Very much more liberal and abusive than the Obama administration. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about making sure that we put the guardrails on the funds so that the funds for production agriculture stay in production agriculture. And uh, obviously we have to be much more careful with them than, than we have in the past because of the lack of integrity in the agency now. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Thank you.